So I'm the biologist for, for your area here. Um, I'll be talking to you today about coyotes um, and our relationship with coyotes and how to keep them wild. So I work for Mass Wildlife. It's the Massachusetts Division of Fishing and Wildlife. The um, mission of Mass Wildlife is to protect all lands and conserve our natural heritage of species. So that's all fish, wildlife, um, concerning snakes, amphibians, mammals, game species, non-game species, and all the plants that help uh, create that ecosystem. So Mass Wildlife does manage um, for coyotes. So we manage, uh, we make sure that all of our species are um, a natural, renewable, sustainable resource, and we treat them as such. Uh, so coyotes can be used for multiple purposes, um, for hunting purposes, for pelts, um, for clothing, and things like that. And we make sure that we, we manage hunting in a way that it can be um, a constant, renewable resource. Um, we regulate through hunting and trapping, help regulate animal control on um, agents, and we help to teach the public. So coyotes are a valuable species, um, ecologically, intrinsically, educationally, and recreationally. So what does that mean? So ecologically, coyotes are really important to decrease the small mammal numbers. So um, mice and rats, um, Bowls, things like that, that that also carry Lyme's disease and other other illnesses. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Is this okay, or would you like a microphone? It's hard to hear in back. I can also push this forward. This from the eastern 
part of America, and and deforested a lot of landscape for agricultural reasons. Um, they extirpated or they killed off uh, wolves because of fear of predators, but also there's a lot of bounties on wolves and cougars. So once they killed oh, almost the entire population of wolves and they deforested the area, it, it allowed coyotes to expand their range. So while the wolves were present, they actually kind of kept down the coyote population in other areas. They're, they consistently compete with each other, and wolves tend to kill or, or keep away uh, those coyotes. And today, because of that, they're found in almost every ecoregion, except for the northern part of, um, of Alaska there. So let's talk about coyote distribution in Massachusetts. So I'm sure people here, the older cohort, probably when they're kids, never saw a coyote. Probably never heard them. It wasn't very common, especially out east, to ever have any mention of them. Um, so in 59, the distribution, so the reports that we've gotten were in yellow. Can you see that yellow compared to the green there? So it was kind of scattered, random, not many observations at all. Then in 1980, we had more reports, and it's coming from Western Massachusetts for the most part. Oh. We'll go a little further on to 1990. It was almost in, in, in every part of Massachusetts, except for really around Boston and all those really dense urban areas. And today, they are present and observed and accounted for all over Massachusetts, except for the islands. So let's talk about coyotes. Um, coyotes, the, the scientific name is Canis Machans, and that actually means barking dog. They're also considered the song dog, and you heard at the very beginning all the sound that they make, um, which surprises to most people aren't that many coyotes are involved in those vocalizations. It sounds like a pack, a large pack that you can um, Coyotes, coyotes have, um, a little bit, a very little bit of wolf DNA. Um, as coyotes were moving northeast and southeast, when they moved northeast, they came in contact with some of the very, very low, low, low density populations that actually existed during that time of wolves. So even though humans had extirpated most areas of wolves, the northern area of Michigan um, actually had some wolves still present. So the wolf DNA that is in our eastern species, subspecies of coyote, is very, very, very small. And it's actually been attributed to, um, to the Michigan wolves they did DNA testing, and that small percent. So not necessarily koi wolves, because it's such a small percent of wolf, um, but there's also domestic dog in coyote DNA, eastern coyote DNA also. So a physical description, Females range from 33 to 40 pounds in Massachusetts. Males, 34 to 47. That's pretty small. Um, and it, once in a while, and it's very exceptional that we'll get a coyote that's 55 to 60 range. That's, that's a very, very large coyote, and it's extremely rare. And even that is small in my lab. <laughs> um, and then as you can see here, the pelts, there's a variety of colors. So I have a couple examples here. Um, you know, they've come in this nice, this typical grizzle, you know, you see where there's the black, that black back. And that's very typical of coyotes. Um, but then you get the, this beautiful blonde. See how beautiful that is? Once in a while you'll actually get a red, and it's almost as red as a red fox. It's really beautiful. So it comes in a variety, also all black. So Color is kind of hard to distinguish uh, coyote from other other wildlife or other species um, because it is so variable. So the coyote life cycle, um, February through March is the prime breeding time for coyotes. Um, that's when 
coyotes that are coming into the into the breeding season or the first time ever breeding um, for through sexual maturity, or is that they're able to move around and find their home range, um, really set their territory. So right now is the beginning of breeding season. So they tend to be extremely territorial, and we'll talk about that more um, later on in this. But they get extremely territorial. They become more visible through people as they're moving, trying to set their territory. Actually, my husband and I were hiking around um, last weekend, and you could see the signs. They'll still do the, the leg lift, like your dog probably does, and they'll set, you know, hydrants or poles or whatever. Coyotes do the same thing. They'll set mark their own territory. So that's what they're doing now, setting territories. April and May, so gestation period is about 35 days for coyotes. So that's when, um, for the younger folks, gestation period is when you become pregnant to when you when the animal actually has pups. So it's the duration of pregnancy. Um, that's about 35 days. So in the spring, April, early spring, April, May, is when pups will start um, to be born. And they'll stay in the den for a while um, until about, you know, maybe about a month. Um, and at that point, at that point, um, they'll actually, uh, they'll start to get weaned off from the mother's milk and they'll start moving out on the landscape. Um, so June and August, they'll start teaching their young how to, how to hunt, um, how to vocalize. So they'll get a lot of, they'll start hearing a lot of vocalizations in the woods from the young pups that are trying to learn. Um, and then September and November, they'll be dispersing. So either young pups will stay for another year with the alpha pea pair, um, which is not very typical. Um, most often they will disperse. And then, so let's talk about social organization. So for the young ones here, what do you think a coyote pack is made of? Yes. Yeah, so there's actually two, there's an alpha pair. So the, the mom and the dad are both alphas. Um, anything else, what else is in your family? Pups, kids, next generation? Yeah, so that's what a family is for coyotes. So um, there's the alpha pair adults and their offspring. Um, and then their pups. So their pups will, their, their newborn pups will be with them always um, until they disperse. And then sometimes, like I had mentioned, some pups will not disperse. They'll stay until the following year and then they'll disperse. So they're highly territorial. So this group family will have their territory and they'll, that, that alpha pair will stay in that territory. Um, so there's that family group and then there's the dispersing, or the transients. And the transients are kind of hovering around these, um, the, the territory, the home range, the home territory of this family group, trying to not get into the territory because they could, the coyotes will get killed. They do, or, or beat off. So they'll try to kind of weave and find their own little area around these, these territories, try to fit in, try to get any food sources. So home range size really depends on food and food availability. So there, it, it varies from um, region to region. So if you have a rural versus suburban area or urban area, there it tends to be rural areas. So in the Berkshires, there is larger home size or home range size um, than in suburban areas because there's a lot more food in suburban areas. There's a lot more bird seed that people put out, trash, compost, um, garbage, all of that is at high density. There's pets, there's squirrels. Whereas if you go to a rural area, it's a lot more spread out. So home range has to be even larger to make sure that they get all of their food sources for all the seasons all year long. And then transients, they can travel quite a bit. They can constantly move around because they never have home until they finally do establish a home. And an average coyote will go from 7 to 16 miles a day. It's some work. So coyote young average six pups in Massachusetts per litter, but they can have anywhere from one to nine. 
Um, that also depends on the success of the mother. Usually as the mothers get older um, and have consistently more successful, they, um, pups or litters, they, they tend to have more. And a lot of this has to do with food availability and population. So population or density of, of the animals, of the coyotes. So we talked about weaned after 35 days. So in six to eight months, they'll start to disperse. Some adults are, are juveniles for this day. Howling and other communication or vocalization. So coyotes are extremely, extremely vocal. Um, they will howl, howl, and they will yip, and they will make a lot of different noises that make them sound like there's a lot of coyotes. And usually it's just the six or five or four individuals in that group. Um, so these vocalizations are communication, just like you would have with your own family or other families, um, to defend their home range. So they'll bark around their home range, um, kind of showing this is this is my home range. No other coyotes are are even <coughs> come here. Um, they will try to attract a mate during breeding, breeding, breeding season um, and during summer when they're starting to learn how to communicate. And it's not necessarily used for hunting purposes. <coughs> so coyotes and resources. So when resources are abundant, there is a higher density of coyote. And when there's a high density of coyote, um, the litter sizes are greater and survival rates increase. When there's scarce resources, we'd assume the opposite, right? So you're going to have lower coyote density. Litter sizes are also going to decrease. Pup survival decreases. Number of yearlings and breeding decreases. So basically, if you if you're in an area, if you're in an area and you're constantly putting food out, feeding wildlife, their home ranges are going to get smaller because they don't need to. They don't need to have that large home range. They can get all their food, everything available in that small area. And their pups, the number of pups that they reproduce will increase, and their survival will increase. So it increases the number of coyotes. And the opposite is true. If you have limited resource available in an urban or suburban environment, the population will decrease. So let's play a little game of fact or fiction. Coyotes only eat meat. Fast or fiction? Fiction. <laughs> yes, fiction. So by a dentition, so if you were to look at uh, a coyote's teeth, their, their teeth here, their canines, they, by dentition, they're considered carnivores. But by practice, they're actually opportunistic omnivores. So omnivores mean that they eat everything. Meat, nuts, fruit, um, insects amphibians, reptiles, they will eat anything they can get their hands on. And they are super opportunistic. So anything that is there, they will try to consume. Coyotes are nocturnal. Fact or fiction? Fiction. Fiction. Coyotes are not nocturnal. Think about all the pictures you've seen of coyotes. Are they during the day or in the night? Day. 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 So actually coyotes, coyotes are, uh, for this picture right here. So coyotes in urban environments tend to be more nocturnal. And that's where people kind of figured that coyotes are nocturnal because most people started making these observations um, and making those assumptions when they're in a suburban or urban environment. Um, but what, but what are, so basically in the urban environment, they are trying to avoid any human disturbances. So what are some human disturbances? Yes. Police cruisers. Yes, noise, vehicles, uh, police cruisers, uh, any people walking on the street, all of these things are disturbances. So they're trying, they, they prefer not to have those disturbances while hunting, while moving. So they kind of shift to working at night. But if they are continually exposed to disturbances and they see humans as not a threat, if there's no hazing going on, 
then they're going to see these disturbances as just another part of the day. So then they begin to come out during the day more often, especially if food is available and there's no threat associated with that. Now in rural environments, where I'm from, you can see a coyote cruising during the day and it's not a big deal because there is nobody around. There's no threats. They're going to hunt, they're going to feed, they're going to do everything they do during the day if that's the right time to do it, for bulls, for anything else. Coyotes can be difficult to identify, fact or fiction? Fiction. Very easy to identify. No. no. You, for some people, it is very easy to identify. But you would be surprised of how many people call and, and say that they've seen a fox, or, or they did see a coyote and it was actually a fox, or it was a dog. Um, or they called and said that they've seen a wolf. And it's not the case. Sometimes when critters are running by, um, I mean, here in Massachusetts, it's easy to assume it's going to be a coyote. Um, but there's some things that kind of are, are key indicators for when you're looking at coyote versus wolf or dog. Wolf and dog have similar characteristics. So coyote has that long pointed snout, and the nose is pretty small. If you look at a dog, a German Shepherd, or a wolf, we don't have any wolves here, but a German Shepherd, um, they have the shorter snout with more of the larger bulbous nose. Um, coyotes have those big ears that are pointed. Dogs usually have floppy ears. Um, so it's, once you get comfortable with it, it is very easy to identify. Eastern coyotes are bigger than Western coyotes. Fiction. Fact. On average, Eastern coyotes are larger than Western coyotes. Um, and that's because of that, that movement east when um, they bred with, with wolves. So when wolves were extirpated um, out of the area, their density was so low that it was, it was out of desperation that a lot of these wolves would choose a coyote for a mate. Because typically now, that doesn't happen because wolves are able to meet, mate with other wolves in areas where there's wolves present. Here, you can actually see the size difference of the skull. Um, this is the eastern subspecies of coyote, and this is the western subspecies. And there's not much, I mean, it's not large difference, but on average, it's about 10 pound difference. Um, the other interesting thing is that sometimes um, coyotes are considered even larger than they actually are. So I told you earlier that they're about, you know, 30, 45 pounds. And people always call them like, I saw an 80 pound coyote. I'm like, wow, that's a big coyote. But a lot of times it's because you have this big, beautiful fur. So you see all this, right now, this time of year, it's prime coat. It's the densest fur, the longest fur. They're mostly all legs. I took the fur away. Look how small they are. Their legs are so long, but their body is so small. And it's, it, it's because of, of that fur. And I think, I think the other thing is um, because of fear. A lot of us have a little bit of a fear of a coyote um, or any predators. And when you see predators, you automatically think, wow, oh, that thing's huge. <coughs> OK, will removing, removing uh, coyotes will decrease the overall population? Nice, that's a good one. I thought it was yes. Okay, so what happens when a coyote is removed from a population? So I'll show you. So you remove one. Remember how we were talking about these transients? Well, that transient within a year will move right back in. There's actually a case, um, I want to say Utah maybe, that uh, there was, or maybe it was Wyoming, there was some coyotes that were on a farm. And the farmer had killed one of the alpha coyotes, the male. The female left her range and actually took back, took back the male to bring it back with her. So that's the case. Either, either um, a transient will come in, or one of the other coyotes will move up and become uh, one of the alphas. So coyotes and mortality. Sorry about that. Okay. So if you have high mortality and decreased competition, it increases the litter size. So does that
that makes sense. High mortality, decreased competition means that they will have, they can actually reproduce and have more pups because those pups will survive in an environment with less coyotes because there's more food available. Get that, that gets a little confusing. And the opposite is true. So if you have low mortality, there's gonna be more, so mortality for hunting, which is not as much as you would get from vehicle or disease. So when you have low mortality, less, less vehicles, less disease killing these coyotes, you're going to have increased competition for resources. So when there's increased competition for resources, when those resources are limited, they're going to have less pups. So the actual number of reproduced pups decreases. And then the pup survival also decreases because of limited resources. So basically, even if you have a coyote, you know, I, I sometimes will get calls that people say, I see a coyote, I want this coyote removed. But even if you get that coyote removed, you're gonna have another transient come. Um, and that transient may not always be the best transient. It might be a problem coyote. So if you have, if you're able to haze the coyote and it's a good, it's a good coyote doing coyote things, it's best just to leave it there. They're always gonna be here. Okay, so if you see a coyote in an urban environment, you should haze them. Because of that 
that competition with the dog. So it's super important to train, to train the coyotes that um, you are a threat, humans are a threat. Factor fiction. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So typically, if a coyote is going to go after a dog on a leash, it's a very bold coyote. Um, and I haven't seen any studies specifically on a smaller dog or a larger dog. But when they're on a leash, it's not for prey purposes. It's usually because of dominance and competition. So yeah, so it's it's a little different in their, those circumstances. Whereas if I think you're, if neither of them are on a leash, uh, there's a probably higher chance that the coyote would go after the small dog because of prey, prey purposes. <laughs> um, fact or fiction, many people are concerned or afraid of coyotes. So who here is afraid of coyotes? You can feel free to raise your hand if you feel threatened by a coyote. Okay, right, or concerned. <laughs> yeah, so actually a lot of people really are. We get a lot of calls about um, coyotes and concerns about children with coyotes around. Um, so it, it happens it happens to be that they're very, very concerned. So what are what are people concerned about? Why do we get all these calls from coyotes? Um, so we get concerns yeah. about coyotes just being there, just being in the urban environment. People think that they should not be there. Um, concerned about depredation of livestock, your chickens. Um, wildlife disease, mange, rabies. Yeah. And then taking of pets. So why do these conflicts occur? A lot of it is because of human behavior. It's our job to make sure that these, these things don't occur. So intentional feeding is huge, that's a huge problem. Intentionally feeding any wildlife you should not do. That makes, that teaches and trains the animal that humans are associated with food. Humans are not a threat. So you don't want to do this. And this can also, like we talked about, increase density. Increasing density of wildlife is never ever healthy. Um, artificial density increases are not healthy. That's what attributes to wildlife disease.
Um, that's basically 0.034% of all coyotes tested in Massachusetts um, out of 138 that have been submitted. Um, and about only 9% have been positive. 21 cows have been submitted, 20% tested positive for rabies. The other problem, habituation. We talked about this. Lack of threats, um, being just acclimating to human presence, being okay with it, human associated foods, um, and food rewards. So that's breaking into a chicken coop and getting that chicken. That's a reward, and they're going to try to, try to get that every time. Bird feeders, huge problem. People don't think coyotes like to eat seeds, they do. Garbage and compost. We get a lot of calls about compost. Pet food, pets. So I talked about that, that um, adaptability of coyotes. Coyotes will eat whatever is available, anytime. So if there is a lot of cats around, they'll shift their diet to cats. So not only do they have a, a, a seasonal shift of food sources from different fruits and nuts and, and small mammals, but if there's a lot of cats available, they'll eat cats. And then gardens, fruits, and fruit trees. So if you're having problems with coyotes in your area, it's really important to pick up the apples that drop. And I know that sounds crazy, but if you don't want them in your area, you should be picking up the apples or the plums or any fruits that drop. Um, so what, what is the progression of coyote behavior? What warrants us or you to call Mass Wildlife or an EPO or a police officer or an animal control agent? So it goes from a severe problem of an individual coyote or sorry, a not at all severe to an extremely severe. So anytime that they're just frequenting and, and moving around your area, that's normal behavior. Um, nighttime attack on unsupervised, it's a little cold because getting into, you know, in your area, maybe a fenced in the area. Um, and then daytime attack on unsupervised dogs, that's more bold, but that's still considered normal behavior of a coyote. That coyote should not be removed because of that. Now, if you get a coyote that starts approaching, approaching you closely, following, following you, um, and not just walking, happens to walk past you, but following you, um, or physically attacks people, those, those obviously are human safety issues. Um, when, a, when a coyote attacks uh, an animal or a pet on leash close to you, that's an extremely bold coyote. That's something that should be also addressed and, and called into the police officer immediately or, or environmental police. So how do we resolve and prevent these conflicts? Yeah. Modify human behavior. That's exactly what we have to do, is remove all human-associated food sources from your, from your home and really work on hazing. So when we talk about eliminating those food sources, remove all bird feeders. I know people love bird feeders, they're great, but there's so many problem animals that we get calls about, like bears and coyotes, that they're just doing their thing, but they're being fed. So they're going to constantly come in. And every time they get a, a, a food um, reward, they're gonna be trained to come back to that location because they know it's a consistent food source. Um, secure your garbages and use compost containers instead of just compost outside. So when I, I keep saying hazing, and sometimes people will say harassment, but hazing and harassment are different. Hazing is a way of training wildlife, where harassment is really the intent to hurt or harm wildlife, and that is not what we're trying to do. Hazing, um, you, if you have dogs, you've done hazing. Anytime your dog jumps on the couch and you don't want him on the couch, you go, hey, get off the couch. And that, that dog learns not to be on the couch. Or if they're kept in a certain room, you, you say, don't, you can't bring them in that room. And anything you use for training, that's a type of hazing. Um, harassment would be, you know, shooting a coyote with a pellet gun for fun, and they're just doing their own thing. That's not right. That's harassment. 
and that is illegal. Um, so hazing, you could be loud, you could use an air horn, you could do any, any offensive noises, pops and pans, um, whistles, whatever, whatever you want, but making loud, aggressive, assertive noises. Um, you can throw objects, people have thrown tennis balls, people have had water balloons. Spray hoses or water gun, that is, that's a good one in the yard. You know, if they're coming through the yard, you have chickens or dogs, um, and you don't want them in the area, and you've tried yelling, and you've tried throwing things, and they are still kind of hanging out there, if you have a hose handy, you should use that. An aggressive body language, or looking big, looking intimidating, looking assertive. Um, you can charge towards the animal. Um, one thing, never retreat with your back turned, never run. Um, that's prey instincts, and that's also um, showing that you are not assertive or bold, and you are not threat. So what should kids do? So number one, um, definitely don't approach any dog that you don't know, whether it's, it's a, any type of cadence that you don't know, even a domestic dog, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, we talked about the difference between coyotes, so remember that. You want to make yourselves look big. Open up your jacket. Reach high. Do whatever you can. Um, and get an adult, too. And again, don't run. Just slowly back away. So you can modify the habitat to help prevent coyotes coming in. Um, so you want to cut back brushy areas, places that they could hide for hunting. Um, brushy areas also harbor uh, very preferred prey species like rabbits and moles, mice. Um, and you can so brush piles, same thing. Um, and you can disturb, eliminate dense sites. So sometimes ammonia, an ammonia rag is really great. So even if even if coyotes have had their pups, if they're just if their dense site <coughs> is disturbed, they will pick up their coyotes and move to a new dense site. And typically, typically coyotes will have two dense sites. So they will have their main dense site and they'll have already created a potential other dense site if something happens with their first one, their preferred. Um, some people have called about fencing problems. So coyotes jumping over fencing. And that is, they can do that. They can actually reach over, hook, hook the top of the fence and pull this up, themselves up and jump over. So if you're having any of these problems or you have concerns, there's something that's called a roll bar that they've created for coyotes. And all it is is just a bar over a bar. So when the coyotes reach up on the bar, it rolls back. So they can't hook and jump over that fence. Contain livestock and pets. All of your chickens should be contained um, and your pets should be fenced in. If you want to let your pets out at night, free roaming. They should be fenced in. Um, electric fence, your fence should be buried Dogs love to dig, so do uh, coyotes. Keep your house cats indoors. And not only for coyotes, but house cats are known to really um, knock down the songbird population. Keep dogs leashed and closely supervised. And especially these next few months when these coyotes are territorial, really work on that. Intolerance. So learning about coyotes, what they do, how they survive, and how they want to survive, um, really try to be tolerable to um, natural coyote behavior. Um, general presence without nuisance, uh, howling. Howling is really cool. Try to listen. See if you can pick out the different the different individuals that are creating those yips and those barks and those howls. It's really fun. Um, and then let them pursue their natural food sources. Uh, just don't try to put out your own food sources for them accidentally. So removal, so there are problem coyotes, and it's usually just one individual. It's not the whole population. Once in a while it can be a family if it's constant reward and constantly learned and passed down. Uh, but there is, there is some times where we need to actually remove coyotes. <coughs> it's, when it's a direct threat to human safety. Um, property is damaged. And only um, when the coyote that's responsible for these issues can be positively identified. You can't just indiscriminately say, 
all coyotes you have to go now. So who can like, legally um, take this coyote if it's actually confirmed to be a public threat? So police officers, animal control oh, officers, if they're, they're deputized, so sometimes they'll have an AC, they're called um, ACOs and they might work for your local police station. Mass environmental police officers, EPOs, uh, certified, coyote certified problem animal control agents, um, and then municipal animal control agents, licensed hunters and trappers. You know, if you're really concerned too, you can always have hunters and trappers. They utilize a, a naturally renewable resource. So anything that these people have to do, they have to abide, obey the discharge setback limitations of roads. So 150 feet away from roads, 500 feet away from a house. If it's a health and public safety issue, that does not need to be the case with police officers or environmental police officers. So if you're a property owner, you do have the right, according to chapter 131, section 37, to dispatch um, an animal. If they are having, if there's a property damage issue, they have to be in the middle of damaging property. Uh, or if there is a problem, if there's an immediate problem with public safety or human safety. Um, and the only people that can do that is an immediate family member uh, or a, an employee. So if you know, coyotes were taking your uh, gourds or something like that. And that has to be by legal means only. So shooting or trapping. Um, and it has to be within the act. So it's important to know if you, if you have a problem coyote, you should all know that this coyote will have to be dispatched. There is no trapping and moving coyotes to a new location. There's a problem animal. Nobody else wants that problem animal. So it has to be removed. Um, trapping is really difficult. It, we, in the state of Massachusetts, since 1996, we are not allowed to use leg pole traps. Um, so that's usually a, a quick way to, to trap. Um, that's how all wolves were relocated with foothold traps. Some of them are very, um, very friendly. Uh, so you have to use a box trap. And understand, canids are extremely, extremely intelligent. Box trap coyotes, good luck. Because at that point, what you're doing is you're creating a food source at your house because you have to bait them in. And they get close to it and they back away. So it might take a while, but in the midst of you baiting that one problem coyote, you're also baiting all of the other coyotes because they're getting a free meal. So it's not effective and it's not efficient. So these are the leg hole traps I was talking about. Um, this is a, a snare and that's a foot hole trap. And that bows are banned. Uh, hunting and firearm restrictions. Um, these are also some legal limits that we just talked about. 550 feet from the road. Um, artificial light is prohibited for, uh, for hunting coyotes. And then, of course, you have to follow your own town bylaws and regulations, which can be more strict than, um, than the state. And that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? They can have all of those ticks. It's not as common, but absolutely. That's another vector for, for tick-borne disease. Anything else? Yes? What happens to a coyote that has mange? So if, if, a, if a coyote it has a healthy immune system, mange is a, it's not necessarily a death sentence. Um, now, if they don't have a healthy immune system, or there's a high density. Usually, mange occurs. Mange usually occurs in artificially high dense areas. So places where people have been feeding. There's a lot of coyotes. 
coyotes will get maged. They'll start moving around and spreading. But in the winter, that is a big threat. Because what, hap what happens is it's not necessarily the hair, hair loss that's killing them. It's the fact that they have trouble hunting because of hair loss, because they're constantly itching. They have trouble sleeping because of the hair loss. So they, if they have sleep deprivation, they start losing a lot of weight, and they can't keep themselves warm in the winter. So in the winter, sometimes they'll actually freeze to death because of that. Now again, with mange, um, the only thing you can do and the only humane thing you can do is dispatch that animal if it comes to the point, or just let the animal, I mean, that's part of nature. There's a reason why there's mange, um, and it's because of a high density situation. So that's another way, kind of nature, nature taking its course, saying it's too high, it's too many individuals in that area, there's disease, helps bring that population down again. But you're not gonna trap them, you can't trap them, and try to try to give them medication, it's extremely difficult. And you definitely, definitely do not wanna put any medication um, in, in the environment, because there's a lot of amphibians and um, some birds that is actually completely toxic, They're, it's toxic to them, so that can kill them. So you don't want to try to feed them any any um, medication to treat each. Anything else? Yes. I want to get it right at home. So the sightings of cats today were passing. So um, also, people have photographed. It's like a jaw, another well, close, kind of like a blasting seed or mountain or something that's taken up with the cat with the coyotes. They actually like two different people have photographed. And the rangers, the fact the rangers and they said, you know, they're afraid that that particular dog would attack, you know, person with a dog. Would have you ever heard of that? Like people abandoning their animals in the state forest or whatever, and then the dog takes up with a cat? Not typically. Yeah, usually if that were to happen, typically what happens is the, the cat would um, kill the dog. Because again, it's it's <coughs> it's a a, a threat. That dog is a threat to their territory. They see it as a, as a as a challenge. So typically, a dog would be killed by a coyote if there's a threat. Um, but I've not I've not heard of that. No, I mean there's. The rangers have seen it. The people that are out there working. On yeah. The animals, and then two different people that go to the I've seen I've heard the opposite of um, a domestic dog taking in coyote or or a wolf. Yeah, and they try to have like a wolf that lost, uh, she had lost her alpha pair, her alpha male. Um, there was no other wolves around and she would <coughs> up with, uh, she would sleep every day by the cage of a male, of a dog. So I've, I've heard that. But a dog going into a coyote pack, I have not heard of. That's interesting. What town is that in? Um, well, it's Foxfield, it's with Hamilton. Okay, yeah. yep. Yeah, that's yeah, like okay. I call the DCR conservation recreation. There are so many, it's like a paradise to lose dogs now because the, uh, there's only um, rangers there from Florida Bay to Labor Day. <coughs> Okay, there used to be. 
see a family of them that lived there. They go between there and Cedarville, Vermont. Yeah. And stuff. So um, I work for like back and small stuff. But what a lot of people don't know is I have a stick that I that I put inside just in case I do see coyotes at night. And yeah. stuff. And then I let the police know and they then they come in and they have to clear the area. No. Yeah, I always see Yes, a lot of people will do that too in areas where coyotes frequent. No, no, the stick is in case they charge me. If the oh. animal will then eat the stick and not my hand. Right, yeah, just, yeah, yep. Yeah, some people have stuff like anything that they can throw at or just comfort. Typically they won't come close enough, but just comfort. Something to wave around. Yeah, and when they have their pups, like I knew in the spring they were having their pups. Yep. Because my vet said, you know, stay off those trails and stay on the main avenue part. But like, are they more protective when they having their pups or when they're breeding? Oh yeah, they're they they're more protective of their territory um, when they are breeding, uh, but they're extremely protective of their pups. So should you like stay off of those trails? I mean, I just completely stay off of them now. You know, pit bulls and the. Are they denning right next to the trails? Are they denning right next to the trails? Well, on the trails, though, we have to do these like hills. So it's mostly so during that during the time where the pups are denning, um, they're protective of their den. So there's going to be one, you know, usually the the alpha female will be in the den with uh, or around the den with the pups um, because she's lactating and they're milking and everything, and the male is out hunting and he's so concerned concerned with hunting. It's usually not too much of a threat. But again, if there's, um, there, it, it's it's mostly habituation of humans. So if there's food resources available, yeah, that dog could be taken. Not typically out of challenge, usually. It's usually these couple months. Um, but if they feel threatened, if another dog goes close to the den, absolutely. And like, why the state parks? I mean, I don't know if I'm there's a lot of state parks. Why aren't they educating people more? Like, why aren't there signs that they've got those kiosks everywhere, wherever you enter? Why aren't they educating people like, you know, uh, February and March are your breeding season there, they can be protected. Because there's packs out there everywhere. I mean, every time yeah. you meet somebody on a trail, they say, oh, there's a pack over here or whatever. So why aren't they educating people? I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I think maybe some people don't think that people care, you know, or, or Uh, is there much commercial value of real pelts? No. 
not much. So all it seems like a wonderful bill. It's beautiful, yeah. And you guys are all welcome. You know, kids, please, you're welcome to touch this. This is um, these are all educational felts. So all of the the nails and the the, the padding is all still here. Um, it's a great way to learn about the pelts, but they are beautiful. And trappers simply trap um, out of the enjoyment of trapping for fur bears or uh, harvesting a coyote for the for the enjoyment of that. Um, people will eat the meat of coyote, um, and and fur is an incredible resource for warmth. Um, I mean, it's better than any any type of synthetic warmth that you can really get. To be honest, for the most part, and it doesn't stay wet; it, dry, it dries up really quickly. Um, but no, there's not much value in pet pelts anymore, or fur of any kind, um, which is why a lot of people are not into trapping anymore. Uh, it's one of the other reasons why we have problems with beavers. You know, people, it's just too hard to trap. There's no value. Too bad it isn't a delicacy. But I know, right? <laughs> they're cool though. They're they're beautiful animals. Definitely appreciate it.